I've been involved in fellowship training since 1991. And we have a major program in recruiting fellows. And so these fellows for research are either MD, MD, PhDs, or PhDs. And they're the essential parts for developing cutting edge research. They are the go-getters. They have a drive to accomplish so that they build their careers. Uh, we cannot have graduate students here because we're not academically associated with the university. So we rely on the research fellows. So it's essential to have the best fellows that can fit into this environment. Why we have, especially in my department, MDH, PhDs, or just MDs, is because they understand translational research better than a uh, general PhD. To date, I probably have more than 100 fellows since I started here. And average, we have about usually four to seven fellows a year in my department. Their program is basically two years. Some do an extra three years. I just had a fellow from Japan just put an extra year in. So it's common. Sometimes I've had as much as about seven, eight years ago, 12 fellows. So it's quite active. And we get fellows from all over the world, from Japan, China, Singapore, uh, the Netherlands, we had a major program, and the U.S. So we have a strong program. So we, we offer in translational molecular medicine is to be able to do translational research. So we have the opportunity to have specimens and the science to be able to combine. And it's a lot easier here than a university because there's less bureaucracy. So uh, tasks and research can be done faster. Our department has a very strong track record of publishing, which all the fellows who come here want. They need publications, so when they go back to their home institute, it's either to get a job or to get promoted. So it's very important that they are successful here, and that's what attract. It's like from Japan, I have several from Osaka University, Tokyo University, Keio, which are national universities. I'm now in some of these 8th to the 11th generation. What I mean is after one fellow goes, another comes from the department. So that's the trust they have over the years of continuation. I'm Yuta Kobayashi. Uh, I'm from Osaka University in Japan. Uh, my specialization is uh, abdominal surgeon and oncology. I'm working uh, in translational molecular research program uh, and working as a postdoctoral research fellow. The program is uh, finding some biomarkers or novel functions in cancer uh, and uh, working with uh, clinical doctors and uh, submitting uh, samples to the sequencing center and analyze them. And finally, uh, we have to summarize uh, our research to the article and expect to uh, be accepted in certain journals. I have to mentor them because they all each come with a different skill set. So you have to know what their skill set is. You design that project that way. So usually we have a high risk and a low risk project. So at the end, they have to walk out after two years usually with publication, otherwise it's a failure. So we have to design the project appropriately to their skill set, or if they don't have the skill set, we have to help them build that skill set. And in my department, the way we have, we have research technicians senior and laboratory managers, which help them to facilitate this. So they're not on their own. And the other thing I emphasize is the fellows, they work together synergistically, develop their project. One of the major programs which I started, it's about now seven, eight years old, is the Genome Sequencing Center. It is unique. I call it a boutique sequencing center because we just don't do regular RNA and DNA seq. We do epigenetics, we do very in depth, and we do uh, MRD minimal residual disease detection on tissues for occult tumor cells. Originally, it was well known what we started was 
We're called tumor cells and central node program that we developed here for melanoma, breast, and colon cancer. So with the sequencing center, we do we have focused on obviously translational research, but interrogating tissue, particularly tumors, in unique signatures, and so that we can identify for either prognostic prediction or diagnostic. And we do this in tissue and paraffin, which we are very good, we're very well known for doing paraffin, which are archival tissue. But we also do it for plasma and more recently in urine. So we can detect circulating DNA, microRNA, uh, and be able to use it for diagnostic, prognostic, and prediction. Our lab is next to the hospital, so we can get so many clinical samples and apply to the sequencing center. Uh, it's very uh, powerful for our research. And uh, we can find uh, very uh, universal uh, findings in all of cancers. Uh, it's very attractive. Most of the lab uh, can experiment very specifically, but uh, sequencing center can uh, get uh, all of DNA or RNA of cancer cells, and we can uh, analyze them very broadly. So at the same time, we also developed a large program in database analysis, either public or our own, so we can look at sequencing data and do bioinformatics and develop unique programs which we do in collaboration with others to interrogate data already out there. So the, one of the features out there as I was involved with TCGA, the Human Genome Atlas of Cancer, uh, several years ago we had from our department, we had 31 publications all in top journals. Uh, mostly in cell related journal series. That was designed so that there was data from different omics. So now is the, what we call PANCAN is to be able to look at those sequences in the bioinformatics. In other words, hunt through those. So that's what we do to hunt new genes and new pathways and what are common, as we call it, pancam. So one cancer can have very similar to another cancer. So this helps in diagnostic and also therapeutics, and more recently, immunotherapy resistance. Actually, Dr. Ferni is very famous for uh, the biomarker study, and uh, we have a fellows meeting or sequencing center meeting every week, and we discuss uh, how to proceed the projects uh, creatively or productively. Uh, so it's very educational for me. So we do this in regularly, and the fellows I bring here that come with work with it, so they're all required to have bioinformatics and to perform that. So they can do database analysis and also our own databases. We have um, large profiling of RNA-seq and uh, epigenetic profiling. So we have a lot of clinically annotated data that they can database mine and combine it with others. The other aspect of this is we do uh, immune responses, checkpoint inhibitor therapies. Uh, we were doing it here, monitoring patients who receive modern-day immunotherapies, particular melanoma. So we developed assays for in blood, circulating DNA, and microRNA, different forms of circulating DNA, not just mutations, but we do amplifications, we do deletions, and we do uh, other indels that are unique to identify monitoring. In other words, we monitor patients for responses and resistance and we've published a lot of publications on that which is the next step in assessing immunotherapy to identify resistance early to be able to change in a patient's treatment regimen and the blood biopsies is one of the best as we first pioneered back in the 90s mid 90s 
uh, when our first publication came out. So we do this uh, in different forms. Uh, we've now applied it to urology in monitoring prostate cancer patients and renal cell carcinoma patients. So we've adapted this. We have a big program we adapted in immunology. Uh, the original, when I came here, and we were focused on immunotherapy vaccines. We had the large multicenter cancer vaccine, two phase, two trials, and they didn't pan out totally, but many people have syndicated this was the foundation, uh, the cancer vaccine to modern day immunotherapy. And this was led on. Uh, I got then into more into afterwards molecular diagnostics, which as you know, is a huge field out there uh, circulating the DNA or liquid biopsy is just all over. And I present routinely maybe five to seven presentations or meetings a year. And we publish significant amount on this. Now we've gone back to immunotherapy per se, and we look at immune resistance, immune responses, not just with our own group, with other groups. So we have a very strong collaboration with MD Anderson, U of Penn, MGH, uh, Harvard, uh, Moffitt. Um, so we collaborate extensively. So it's just not looking at specimens from our group here, but all over. We also collaborate. We have programs in China with University of Fudan, who I work with uh, neurosurgery department for last seven years which we have a major program in looking at immune responses and resistance in primary brain tumors such as GBM and uh, glioblastomas. So we are quite extensively involved uh, in immunotherapy. Uh, this year, it's amazing. We already have 15 publications. Um, two major publications that we did was on COVID assessing patients, multi-center trial with Institute of System Biology, which is our sister group up in Seattle. And we did monitoring immune responses. These are pillar papers. One was in Cell and one was in Nature Biotech. Uh, the one paper in uh, Cell was actually a full article in New York Times. So, so it was quite uh, unique. And we still have some more coming out is I just finished another trial on Hispanics with COVID. So this is our immunology, our re-emphasis going back um, to what, how we started. We are now looking at primary more immune resistance. Why do some of these therapies don't respond uh, in terms of the patients are, have temporary response or toxicities? So we are equipped and just by our publications, as I said, uh, so far this year we have nine. Uh, one of our major public, couple of major ones, we found uh, is coming out in PNAS, which is a major journal, which shows uh, we found what causes resistance to Herceptin treatment in breast cancer is due to immune suppression, and we found how we can reverse that. Another study which we found is in breast tumors too. Uh, patients have hypoxia. And so T cell exhaustion, we found a way how to reverse that. So over the year, it's important now is collaborations and because that's the current directions. It's not just as an institute itself. It's what you collaborate outside that elevates you. And because you do that, you elevate the institute from either the collaborations or the publications, and you get recognized better. And that's what we foster a lot in my department to do that. I have many collaborations uh, um, in Japan to the top universities there, and we have a constant uh, input from them of fellows that come here to train. So this is our future is to keep on building molecular translational medicine, but focus on particular topics, like I said, epigenetics, immunotherapy, 
and uh, blood biomarker diagnostics. So uh, after this fellowship program, uh, I would like to find some uh, something universal for cancer, uh, and uh, I hope the uh, findings uh, we will find uh, will contribute to the treatment for patients. We want to keep on building this, so we're at the cutting edge, and we need innovative minds, creative fellowship, so that we can constantly stay. And as I said before, the fellows are one of the keys that drive the research programs. You get good productive fellows, your program drives forward. And they are the critical mass. It rises the level of the institute research capability. I constantly emphasize that they're the ones that help your publications, that write them, and at the same time, get the high impact so that you can be competitive in grants. And so they are a key to keep the research program to a high standard.